chatting with you all. I don't usually get to do a talk about uh, what my life is. I'm usually doing a talk on what my product is or how I feel about hardware or, you know, how I feel about being a startup CEO that's a lady or like, you know, all, all those kinds of things. Um, so it's, it's a bit odd, in fact, to talk about how I got here. Um, but I like this slide because this, everybody starts out like this. <laughs> this is like how all of us were at one point in time. Or no matter where you end up in whatever uh, company, you're always started like this. Um, and now what I am is, um, I guess, I'm a, uh, I have a PhD in material science and I studied batteries for a long time. And now I'm four and a half years into running a hardware startup, which is kind of a miracle. Uh, in hardware startups, but um, I guess we'll get to that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I grew up uh, in Mena, Arkansas, so it's a town of 6,000 people, and uh, to be in a place like California, especially Silicon Valley, doing what I do is a little bit weird, especially to my family and all my friends who um, most are still back in Arkansas. Um, but from from this age, well, it's it's totally rural there. Um, it's a lot of farming and things like that. Um, there was one, the first thing that happened to me um, that really allowed me to um, see that the world was a bigger place than the town that I lived in was pre-science camps. Uh, and my parents were, um, you know, they didn't really, they, they, were, they were from uh, Chicago and California and Texas, I guess. They're, that's sort of like their sphere of places that they were. And the one thing that they always worried about was that, um, you know, that I would just always stay in Arkansas. And that's, you know, what my life would be. Not that that's a bad life or anything, but um, I was definitely a kid who seemed like she needed to go places. So what they could do as people who, you know, neither one of them, well, there's like a GED in my family, so there's like not a lot of advanced education. What they thought is like, we'll teach her to use her hands. We will teach her how to make things. And whether it was in the wood shop or carving things or whatever, um, they made sure that I always had tools available in my hands and that I could build things. Because from their perspective, as long as you can build something, someone will pay. Um, which I thought was actually kind of a, it's kind of a progressive opinion to have, um, if you have a young girl in Arkansas. Um, and there weren't a lot of kids like me in my town, so then I ended up at these science camps, which were kind of amazing. There were these free science camps that um, Arkansas put together, um, and it was really designed for kids who didn't have a lot of cash, didn't have a lot of opportunities, but you could go to these camps for two weeks for free and you learn about <clears throat> geology. And I was a person who just took full advantage of it. I was like, I want to do the geology one. I want to do the ecology one. I want to do the space one. <laughs> I want to do whatever. Um, and thankfully, there was an opportunity for me in uh, in Arkansas with these free science camps. So go free science camps for poor kids. And then the most amazing thing happened to me, which was that they uh, they started this free nerd school in Arkansas. It was called the uh, it was called the Arkansas School for Mathematics and Sciences. Um, yeah, totally amazing. That's just exactly what it was. Um, but the Clintons were governors, and they're like, man, there's a lot of kids that like don't even have any AP classes at their school, and we're not really sure what is going to happen to them. So let's just make a boarding school for the whole state, and any kid can apply. And it's totally free, paid for by the state. And that happened, um, I was in the, I guess, the third year of that school. And I found out about it at the free uh, science camp. So this is me over there. And these are all of the girls that lived on my floor, the fourth floor. We used to have tea fires, parties together. And this is really where I found out there's people like me out in the world. And this is my family still. Um, we're very close to each other, um, mostly because all we were we came from all corners of the state, and we got together and we're like, wow, this is like a really, uh, this is our chance. This is like our <laughs> our chance to really like make it and do things with the skills that we have, um, uh, and and maybe try to have a broader reach. So at this point in time, you know, my sphere finally expanded outside my hometown to like 
town that was like an hour and a half outside my hometown. Um, but really what it allowed me to do is see that, that there were other people like me, and that I wasn't isolated um, or weird or anything like that, um, but that I could, that I finally could tap into this network of smart people who did things, um, which I'm sure if you're here, you probably felt something similar. Um, and then I got into MIT, which was, for me, I, I don't even remember how I found out about MIT, but I was like, that is the place that I will go. It's the only place I applied um, to college at and happened to get in, thankfully. Um, but what I found there was that, um, you know, there's a lot more nerds out there in the world than I thought. <laughs> there's way more. Um, but that, that, uh, that I was definitely not the smartest of them and that that didn't matter. So we're thinking about life learnings. Like my identity up until this point had been like, be the smartest person, be the smartest person. I know all the things, I can do all the things. And then getting into MIT, it's like you're thrown into a sea of other people who are just as capable as you, if not more capable than you. And then you sort of have to reorient who you are in the space, and um, it was also a chance for me, as like a woman shaped like this, to be participate in a sport that was suited to me, rowing, um, which I had never done before, but was another opportunity. Um, it became another thing that I did for six years, uh, in fact, when I was in Boston. Um, so, I guess, yeah, it's funny, I was thinking about like, I, I really liked Marco's talk because he was very like detailed about the things that were the life learnings and I'm mostly just like, yeah, just like do the next thing. Like, just then you do the next thing and then you figure out what the next thing is. Um, but for me, at this point, it was all just about do something, anything, anybody who will let me in the door, I will do that. Um, and when I was at MIT, um, there was like undergraduate research opportunities, so I just did those. And it was just about do every single thing possible because I don't want these doors to close. I just want to keep opening doors. Um, so that's what I ended up doing. Uh, and then after MIT, I was like, I'm not really sure what I want to do. I got a degree in chemical engineering, um, and so this was, commenced my first stage of wandering. So when I entered, like, I guess up until this point, it had been all about survival. Like, I'm gonna survive this, and then I'm gonna get to this, and then I'm gonna get out of the state, and then I'm gonna go to a college, and then, and then I, I did that. Then I'm like, now I'm, now I'm cool. Like, people think that I went to a place, and they're not gonna just ignore me. Um, so it was hard to know what to do, and so I went to, I ended up getting a job in DC as a material scientist. Um, and that didn't really work out, so in this like grand romantic gesture, I moved back to Boston, where my boyfriend was, uh, finishing up at MIT, and then we started this business together, which was, um, in 2003, it was like an eBay sniping business. I don't know if you know what that is, but if you want to buy something on eBay, you should really wait till the end of the auction, and you can just kick over your bid and the thing that you want to a service, um, and we can place the bid for you, like two seconds of the auction. Um, but what that allowed me to do was kind of accidentally open another door, which was business. Um, so this boyfriend that I had at the time taught me how to program in Perl, which was really cool. I had never programmed before. Um, so he, he was just like, hey, you know, we should really spend more time together because we're both busy. So like, let's, I'll teach you how to program and we'll make this, we'll make a web service. Um, and in 2003, that was kind of a weird um, thing to do, but we did it anyway, and it ended up uh, being able to support my wandering lifestyle for several years, which was nice. Um, and then, in fact, it supported my lifestyle uh, when I decided finally what I wanted to do, which was go to grad school. Um, but I wanted to go to grad school and uh, work on batteries. Um, and the reason I wanted to work on batteries is I thought, well, you know, no matter no matter what wins in the race for renewable energy, uh, we're always going to need batteries or something. Maybe small batteries or big batteries, whatever. Um, so that thesis led me to UT Austin where um, just so happens I, I worked for John Goodenough who is kind of responsible for all of the batteries that are in our pockets. Um, he's 94 now, um, was a really incredible person to work for, but I was just like, that guy, I'm gonna work for him, and I'm gonna email them, 
<laughs> and get a job there. So I ended up spending like eight years there. Um, but inserted into this story is the fact that um, I showed up to grad school like six months pregnant. So there was a lot of detours <laughs> when it came to me uh, finishing grad school. I quit twice. Um, and I went to Kentucky. I lived with, um, I don't know, it's so, so random now that he's a senator, but Kentucky Senator uh, Thomas Massey has 1,200 acres in Kentucky. I used to live on that land. Um, doing nothing, figuring out what the heck I wanted to do, but like it was a valuable time for me because um, I got to sort out a little bit more about what I cared about in life and the things that I wanted to do, and I was like, yes, I do love business. Yes, I do really care about batteries. Um, and so I ended up um, back at UT, and third time's a charm for finishing this dissertation. These are five, this is five copies of my dissertation in 2012, which was a proud moment for me, having, you know, groveled several times to my advisor, but shout out to my advisor. He always said to me, he was like, you know, you've got what it takes. Whenever you're ready, just come back. And I'm, I'm, I'm here waiting for you. You're totally smart enough. You can totally do this. Just come back when you're ready, when your kid is a little bit older. Um, and so that was, a, that was a really incredible thing to me because I had always been told, if you stop, you'll never go back. If you stop, you'll never go back. If you stop, you'll never go back. Like, that was just in my mind, and I was terrified of it. But I also felt at the same time like, I want to be a mom to my kid. I can't do this right now. I can't do both things to the, you know, to the level of quality that I want to. So, um, so I stopped, and then I finished. Um, and then after that was more wandering because I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do now. I got this battery degree, and. Um, and so I took two months and just rode my bike around and camped and lived out of my car. And um, it was another point where I really needed to decide what's the, what's the thing. And it, it felt a little bit arbitrary, but um, I ended up coming to San Francisco and I interviewed at Tesla. And that place, you know, no offense to anybody who works at Tesla, but it felt a little weird there. Um, so I didn't, I didn't end up going to work there. I ended up um, working on this uh, government-funded project to build CNC machines for education. Um, so robots that cut things uh, and you put them into high schools. And the reason I did that was actually because um, I remembered that way back to slide one and the kid in Arkansas and I thought, you know, not everybody is going to be able to go to MIT. Not everybody is going to be able to like have all these opportunities, so maybe if I put tools in the hands of the kids in high schools everywhere, um, maybe they'll be able to open some doors for themselves. Um, maybe if they don't have parents who are always like, here's a tool, here's a tool, like my parents were, um, there might be an option. So it was kind of a complete, well, not like, not like totally off course, but I was like, you know, supposed to design a battery for Tesla, and then instead I decided to run a program that was building robots for kids. Um, and this was the first thing that we built uh, in that project. We built, ended up building 14 of these. It's a, um, it's a robot that uses a, an exacto knife blade here, and you feed in cardboard, because our mandate was, well, what's the cheapest cutting robot that you can make for schools? And we're like, well, there's cardboard in every school. There's pizza boxes over there. There's cardboard everywhere that's free. Exacto knife blades are five cents. Like, let's make a robot exacto knife blade. Um, and so we built that, and it was amazing. And it was it was supposed to be this like three years, eight million dollar grant from uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. But then um, all of that ended unexpectedly. So in spring of 2013, we're like, yes, we've got these prototypes, look at the software, it's so easy to use, like, we're going to put these uh, robots in like a thousand high schools, and we had our list of high schools and everything, and it was all fully paid for, um, and then that just totally ended. Um, they said, 
hey, you know, why is DARPA funding an education project? Like, this seems a little weird. <laughs> Slash that. Um, so we ended up uh, we ended up taking another prototype that we had made during that time, which was a, a milling machine. So a milling machine is you know you control it with a well in this case um, a computer, and it just has a, a really fast rotating cutting blade, kind of like a drill bit, and then it moves up and across. So instead of, you know, a drill bit can cut down through materials, this one can cut across through materials as well. So we built this uh, also, um, and we thought, well, between this robotic exacto knife blade and this milling machine, the milling machine already exists in the world, and people kind of, they have a, a way to wrap their head around what it is and what it's for. Um, so we ran a Kickstarter campaign for this. And in retrospect, that was a really crazy thing to do. It was not a good idea, but we did it anyway and we survived. So made this like Kickstarter machine, which was like, we delivered it nine months late, which is actually I think better than average when it comes to hardware products delivering. <laughs> Just saying. Um, but so this one we delivered uh, nine months late, um, and it took us it took us 16 months to get from here our prototype to the Kickstarter units being delivered, which is like 200 units. Um, and then I, I learned how to fundraise. I became like a proper Silicon Valley CEO on uh, fundraise, and then we got to make the first commercial unit. So um, so from here to here was 16 months and then to here was 11 months. Um, and this was our first attempt at putting a product out there in the world. And what was nice is like about a thousand of those went out in the world. And we got to watch people. And you know, I thought that the, the ones two previous was a prototype, but this was also a prototype. Like you really don't know what's gonna happen with hardware until you, you put it out there and you watch people use it. And people were, and, and so we did this really painful exercise after we put them out there in the world. We said, well, what, we interviewed people who didn't buy. Like, people that we, like, called, who emailed us or whatever. And we said, like, well, why didn't you buy the other one? And they said, well, it's too loud. It's not precise enough. It's not fast enough, you know. So we aggregated all of this user data. And because we didn't really know what we were doing, we were, like, we were supposed to work on an education project. And now we're, like, you know, knee deep in uh, hardware startup land. Um, but we took their advice and we made, we ended up launching last year this, uh, this other mill pro, which was faster and more precise um, and quieter than the one before. And this one is great. This actually does what people need. Um, and so this is a really arbitrary place to land. Like if you start in Arkansas, you know, <laughs> holding a cookie in your hand, rocking in a rocking chair, uh, and then you end up here. And the point is that it doesn't really matter what you do or how you get there, but if you keep just like taking each stage of your life with joy and like this is an open door and I'm just gonna make the most out of every single step, um, you know, the, I'm incredibly proud of this machine and the, all the all the ones that are out there in the world now, and um, and like what an impact it has on people's ability to make things. Um, and I'm incredibly like fueled by that uh, because that's me. That's me when I was a kid, um, having access to tools without having to ask permission. Uh, was a big deal to me. It uh, it allowed me to get to where I am today, and so it's in some ways this little white box is like full circle for me. Um, so now what? Uh, I'm now at a uh, at a turning point where I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with my life. Um, there's this company that exists, and people are happy, and they make the machines, and people use them, and whatever. But um, I. I don't, I don't really know what I'm supposed to do now um, because I did all the things that I thought I was supposed to do um, and I guess I'm going to have to take some of my own advice. Maybe I should go on another bike trip or something. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess my closing, closing comments is that like, it's never over. You never like get to a place. 
Um, it's just always one more adventure after the adventure that you just stopped having. Um, and uh, all the things that people said about, you know, like having kids or getting married or whatever, and the things that will slow you down, like, that's all bullshit. Um, it's just, you know, like, if you really want to do it, you'll do it. Um, uh, and, and thankfully, uh, and so I guess, I don't know, I guess I'm just sort of proof of that. You just keep going, just keep doing the next thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess sharing what you know. I guess there does come a point in time where your obligation is to, is to share it with the people um, you know, who might be pushing up against their wall and not really ready to break through. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions about anything that I said or anything that you're going through or whatever, I probably don't have the answers, but I'll take a stab <laughs> at them anyway. But yeah, thanks. I'm just curious what, what, what happened in the face of Snipe Swipe or your Snipe Oh, yeah, Snipe Swipe. You even looked at the name. Uh, Snipe Swipe still exists. It still exists. We we you know when we first started that business, we were running it on virtual servers, which was crazy because I'd have to wake up in the middle of the night and like fix a bunch of stuff because virtual servers in 2003 were not a thing, really. And then we found about about S3 when it came out, and that transformed our lives. Um, but I actually sold my half of that business to my business partner, and so it still runs. You can still go use it if you want to. Um, it's kind of interesting. We were like a little barnacle on the whale of eBay, and so as that whale dove down and down, um, and, and less people were uh, bidding on things on eBay and said buying things on um, eBay, um, it just sort of like reached this state where we just had this like 10,000 customers who were at that point they've been using it for about a decade, so they're. Um, they're, they're 45 to 65, and the only thing they care about is that this website never changes. I just want my stuff in the same place where I can look at it and know what I bought for the past decade, because eBay deletes all that stuff, but we save it for people. Uh, yeah, so interesting little niche yeah. of the web. <laughs> yeah, still going. Um, has there been some particular people that shape or inspire with you a lot or maybe yeah, giving you really helpful advice or yeah um, well there's a couple my dad uh, told me he had this like phrase that he said which was you're a short timer you know whenever I would be like close to the end of the thing and I'm like this is so hard I don't know what I'm gonna do next he's like you're a short timer a short timer now you've like made it most of the way you just keep doing it um, and then I also had um, in, in my phone, he's uh, Department of Motivation, um, which is Saul Griffith. He happens to be, uh, he's an entrepreneur over in the mission. Um, and he was really helpful to me because I, at, at one point in my, um, I think the second time that I quit grad school, I called him on up and I was like, I need a job. And he was like, you need to finish grad school. <laughs> like, he's like, call me up when you finish grad school. So five years later, I called him up and he, he gave me a job which was running the, um, the government program. Um, so he was super influential as well. Um, and then I had this weird ex-boyfriend also at the end of grad school. Um, he told me this line which uh, was sort of enigmatic. He was like, he was kind of but um, he said, he said, fear the tortoise. So I would be like, I've got to get this done. And I was running a business. I was a single mom. I was trying to finish my dissertation. Um, and he was like, fear the tortoise. Like, and I was just like, what the fuck do you mean by that? <laughs> and he is like, you know, you're the hare. You're like, yes, go, 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 go. Like, I've got to get all this stuff. And he's like, but like, fear the tortoise. Like, the tortoise is back here just like taking his time. And in the end, it's going to win. And I think what he meant by that was, <laughs> you got to chill out. Like, you got to really, like, take it easy. Like, you will get there. You will get there. Fear the tortoise. Slow down. You don't have to get there the fastest because you're in a race against yourself. Like, just take it easy. Um, so that was also really helpful. And sage advice from 
you know, a random <laughs> source. Yeah. First, comment on the dress. Being a hardware geek, I want a shirt like that. <laughs> oh, you might have to wear a dress. <laughs> yeah, I got this. I don't know. You can look at the tag. Um, this was, I think I, I told Marco at the beginning of the thing, um, this was the first ever effective Facebook ad. Like, where they totally targeted me as like, because I post pictures of, of PCBs all the time. And it was like, PCBs and circuits, like, like ch check out this cool circuit or whatever that someone made. And then it comes up a dress, like, Facebook ad is like, we know <laughs> that there's anyone who wants this dress, it's you. Yeah, so I totally bought it. Uh, and it fit amazing. So I, I feel like, though, a robot sewed it. Like, this was just like a pure, like, ad to robot, to robot that mailed me a thing. Like, I don't think there's a person involved at all. And another question. Your original prototype for that very cheap robot for education, you know, uh, passionate about education and about bringing kids something like that. Do you still have that prototype? Is it still running around somewhere? We do. Yeah, I really want it to. I want it to exist. So it cost about cost about two million dollars um, <laughs> to take to, t to take something like this and make it into like a real consumer product that you know that costs like less than five hundred dollars or whatever. Um, so I'm waiting for that those dollars to pile up so that I can make it real. But this thing is actually pretty cool because it's it's kind of in between a vinyl cutter and a laser cutter. Um, and it does, you know, foam core and cardboard and balsa and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, no, I really make it if you want to. Like, go for it. <laughs> There's not a thing yet, and probably I won't have two million dollars by the time you get done. With it, but yeah. Is it open source? Um, you know, if I had saved the files, <laughs> I could open source them. Oh man, yeah, no, uh, DARPA has a copy. Uh, but it's not too hard to think about it. It's it's just uh, the only thing that's cool. The, the only thing that's unique about it is instead of having like a solenoid for the reciprocating motion of the head, it has an offset cam. So there's a motor, and you know the spindle of the motor just like spins like this. Um, but when it spins, it's like spinning this dowel that has an offset hole, so it goes like like kind of a wobble. And that wobble makes it move up and down. So that's the only unique thing about this tool. It's basically just a um, electric toothbrush. <laughs> Is that a servo motor that controls the direction of the blade, or a step? Uh, yeah. yes, yes, this one. Yeah. This one has a little gear below it that turns this gear, and that turns the angle of the, the blade. Yeah. Talking more about the, the education project. Like how how would you like um, evaluate the success of this project? Like in terms of how do you balance like the okay we have like revenue targets, revenue objective, but we also have like a social impact to to have. How do you balance these different targets, and what was the objective of like these figures at the end? Yeah, well that was um, that was hard because we. Uh, we didn't have enough money to do it without investors, so we took venture capital, and once you take venture capital, you kind of signed up for a certain path. Um, and I think that, you know, then as a CEO who cares a lot about the customer, your job is like just running defense plays <laughs> while you try to like do the thing for education. Um, and ultimately, we ended up having to veer away from education. Like our product now, this one, wait, no, no, this one. This one's like $3,200, which is not really the right price for education. It needs to be like $1,000. So we needed to go, instead of like going from here, which was $2,000, if we were really going to target education and home use and stuff, we needed to go to the lower end of the spectrum. But we just didn't see enough traction there. There weren't enough people who were like ready for this kind of product. So um, we ended up having to make the trade off and go to the one that was more like professional engineers, but It'll go into some schools, definitely into universities, and kind of trickle its way um, through over time. Uh, but yeah, so it's really hard to, to balance 
you know, your emotional reason that you're doing the business and your connection to those customers with what is, uh, with what's really necessary to run the business. Um, it's difficult. I was just curious, as a uh, fellow grad student dropout, um, what was your motivation to go back twice? Um, well, the first time, what happened, what was the first time? The first time was really like, I, I was like the only person to ever nurse a baby in solid state physics. So <laughs> it was like just really in the midst of things, and I was like, this is just not possible. I can't have a baby. Uh, on my own and be in grad school. So that was kind of like easy. And then to go back, I was like, oh, well, he's old enough, you know, to, to um, go to go to childcare or whatever while I went back. Um, and then I guess the second time the house I was living in got hit by a tornado. So I was like, well, I guess now's the time to like go, go back to grad school. Um, I'm going to have to find a new place to live anyways. Uh, which is so true. It's really true. I didn't have any belongings because they were all moldy. Um, yeah, uh, that was more of just like, well, I guess not like the universe is telling me, but kind of um, to go back to grad school. But really it was like, you know, this friend of mine was like, you know, it's it's very important that you get to the end of the thing. And that last, like, 20% of your degree is really important um, for you, especially as a woman. You know, he was talking to me. He's like, nobody's ever going to question you. Like, if you get the PhD and you went through this process, no one's ever going to say, like, why are you doing that? Or are you qualified for this? Like because it's, it's, uh, it still is kind of a marker, of like a gauntlet that you ran. And so that was a good motivation for me to want to go back, because I'm like, I don't want to erase that time that I spent, um, especially since it was so difficult to spend that time with a kid. Um, yeah, so it kind of made it easier for me to go back. One more question? Uh, yeah, just a quick one. Um, how did you manage it financially? Sorry if it's too personal. No, I love telling a story. <laughs> of course. Well, I had this business that I was running, Snipe Swipe, which was um, uh, feeding off of people who wanted to bid on eBay in the last few seconds. And then literally I went to my boss at one point and I said, look, I make this much money from my business. I make this much money from you. These are all of my bills. I live according to this very strict, like, I have a grocery inventory. Like, I am super, and this is my gap. And it was like $1,100. And I just appealed to my boss and I said, I need this money if you really want me to finish. Like, if the University of Texas at Austin cares about single mothers, we will find this cash somewhere. Um, and so there was an engineering advisory board grant, and I, he was like, you should apply for that. And so I applied for it. And so there was like my business, my like research grant from the Department of Energy, and then like a little sliver of um, charity from the engineering advisory board. But yeah, it was, it didn't feel like a lot at the time. Um, oh, that was like 1100 per semester or something. It was like a small amount of money. Um, but yeah, I just had to beg for it basically get the cash. Yeah, so not always easy, but possible. Yeah. Awesome. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Thank you.